Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How devastating is climate change currently and how devastating will it be in the future? My guest today is going to focus attention on this natural phenomenon that is really wreaking just horrible havoc around the world and it's gonna get worse in the future. My guest today is Mr. James Worst. James Worst, a journalist, specializes in international affairs, and he is the author of the United Nations Association of the USA, a little known history of advocacy and action. His latest book is a sci-fi thriller, Three Degrees, a story set in the future where climate change has become a reality. Jim Worst, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, thanks for having me. Appreciate you being back again. Yeah, You're just I, prolific, I, you just write one book after another. Yeah, I wish it was that, uh, I wish it was that a book like that. But yeah, I started this in 2009, so it's okay, not exactly, there you go. I don't exactly crank them out every Eggs, month. You know. Understood, yeah. You know. Three Degrees, yes. uh, the topic is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Climate change, we know it's mm -hmm. happening. The scientific studies, mm -hmm. are, uh, we're knee deep, ocean deep in scientific studies. Uh, what is what is the significance of the title, and what is the thrust of your book? Well, the significance of the title is that uh, we're, we're, the scientific community says that we can't go much higher in terms of global uh, overall global warming. And I wrote, you know, as part of an introduction, as an explanation, I said, early in the uh, early in the 21st century, the scientific community reached the unanimous conclusion that climate change was inevitable, and that in order to avoid large scale and irreversible damage the warming of the planet had to be limited to less than three degrees centigrade. By the middle of the 21st century, we had reached three degrees. So that's where the title comes from. Uh, basically a warning that um, when this happens, which is in 2052, um, mm -hmm. that we've We've uh, we lost our last chance. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the? Uh, do you have protagonists in the book? Oh, we have, have multiple. Uh, who, uh, <laughs> who are, multiple who are the lines. two key ones? <laughs> um, one of the key, I think, if you were to look at it this way, you could say that the spine running through the book mm -hmm. um, is the uh, U.S. presidential election of 2052, which is one of the reasons it's said in 2052 is a presidential election year. Um, and the and the protagonists there are the presidential and vice presidential candidate of the opposition party, and they are running a um, basically a hopeless campaign. You know, the current president has been in for decades, has basically you know rigged the system to to so the mm -hmm. democracy is a show. And so they're just fighting, you know, basically fighting the good fight sort of thing. So a lot of it is that campaign plus all of the characters involved, um, including the vice presidential candidate. Uh, her assistant is a, is a young woman from New Mexico. Um, the other, some of the other characters include the candidate's father, um, his, uh, who will be chief of staff and some other aides. Um, and other storylines involve um, space stations. Uh, we want to get into that. That's, that can go on for a while, but we can mm -hmm. talk about that if you want. And uh, a pilot, not, not, not the captain, not you know the, the, the superhero, no Star Trek, you know, uh, Jean-Luc Picard. Uh, a, a pilot whose job it is to, is to collect space junk. And, um, and then on Earth, we, uh, we're in Nigeria, the Galapagos, and Borneo. Uh, with various problems, uh, people trying to address the various problems that climate change has caused, or whether we have caused the cause to climate change that caused the problems. Mm -hmm. And um, and then um, part of the, the political intrigue is that in, um, in the Chinese highlands, there's a, um, th they discovered that something huge is being built, and nobody knows what it is. And so that's sort of a thing that's floating out there. Th Mm -hmm. goes throughout the whole book. And, um, and finally, the, um, two of the characters, um, their parents, we focus on, I, f I focus on their home life, you know, just what normal life is like in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, and um, how um, ordinary is going to look, you know, f to our, from our eyes, it looks pretty desperate, but for them, it's gonna be ordinary. Like you know, going to a supermarket is 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 a exercise in futility, mm -hmm. for example, and uh, so that's, that's it. So there's a lot of protagonists. There's a lot of storylines running. Some intersect, uh, some don't. Mm -hmm. At least not running yet. Running parallel, some intersect. No. Now a lot of our users are probably saying, since in the United States we have two major parties, Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans, yeah. they're saying which is which. Mm -hmm. Neither one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One's a, I think you said the Federalist Party, and another is this other party. Yeah. But uh, it is totally a different situation. Twenty fifty two. And uh, 2052 is very significant because we're sitting now at the, really the, 
the beginning of the 21st century, mm -hmm. 2018, along in there, mm -hmm. and we see that the Arctic is melting, melting more mm -hmm. rapidly than it has in the last 1,500 years. We see that the uh, glaciers are melting all around mm -hmm. the world. Glacier mm -hmm. International Park mm -hmm. in Montana and Canada are going to be mm -hmm. without glaciers in five years. Mm -hmm. So uh, 2052 is really a significant date mm -hmm. in that it's going to be much worse then than it is now. Yeah, it'll be kept progressively worse, and it could actually end up being exponentially worse if the as the um, the uh, tidal patterns shift. Mm -hmm. Methane mm -hmm. is released in the in the in the tundras of the of the northern hemisphere. Uh, we lose ice in Greenland and Antarctica. It has a multiplying effect. Sure, 2052 is. I wanted to make it as realistic. I wanted it to be future, um, but I wanted it to not be some sort of uh, a knowable future. 2052 mm -hmm. is the world of our children and grandchildren. The the main character, as I said, the main character is a presidential candidate. He's about 60. That means he's alive today. He's a he's, he's a college student right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted you know it's it, it, it's published by Amazon. You go Amazon.com. It's a it's a Kindle and it's a paperback book. So when it was designing it, it says well you have to. You, know, you need key words, so uh, dystopia is one of the key words. You type in dystopia, um, but in a lot of ways, to me, it isn't. You know, um, uh, Blade Runner, Hunger Games, that's dystopia, that's a future that, what is this? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this, everything in here is perfectly realistic, perfectly understandable. You know, if you're my age, or maybe more to the point, if you're, if you're in your 20s, you're reading this and say, this is, this is my world. This is the world I'm going to be running. And I'm hoping that that's also, you know, from outside of the book that it's telling, you know, uh, boomers and baby boomers and Gen X that um, this is your last chance. <laughs> this is it. This is, <laughs> Get this on board. This is your last chance. <laughs> Come up with a solution right, or right. we're all and in deep water. Yeah. Uh, both, literally. In, in we're going to be literally in, in ways, deep water. Yeah. Well, let's <coughs> focus a little bit on some of the specifics you mentioned. Yeah. You, as you mentioned, there are a lot of threads running mm -hmm. through the book. Uh, you mentioned the highlands of China. What, mm -hmm. what happened in that particular area? There's a, um, uh, what's happened is that mm -hmm. in that, that uh, the, a, a spy set, uh, set, tries to send back to the U.S. Um, the, the schematics of some machine, but he gets stopped before he can finish, so they only have half the schematics. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows exactly what it is. It's big. It has an appendage, you know, kind of a cannon smokestack sort of thing. Um, but nobody knows what it is. And so that's one of the currents running through the book that the, um, that the, uh, the, the, they want to turn it into a, uh, a, uh, a pawn in the presidential election. <coughs> it's significant there besides the fact of what is this thing is that the, the, uh, the, the, the vice presidential candidate uh, was, uh, is, was born a Chinese orphan and she was adopted. Um, by um, by a, a family in the states, and so she has a connection to China, which um, some people want to say, well, this is a good thing, and of course the opposition party is going to say hey, it's not a good thing. You know, she's a she's a fifth columnist, and you know she you know she's gotten it in with those sorts of things. So not only is it a question of what the Chinese device is, that's what everybody dubs it because they don't know what else <coughs> to call it. So it's the Chinese device. Uh, so we don't know how that plays both in terms of the overall story and the specifics of the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. This, um, what we're talking about all the various natural phenomena that are taking place mm -hmm. prompted by climate change. Mm -hmm. And you'd mentioned the Galapagos mm -hmm. Islands. How is the Galapagos Islands affect, first of all, what are, where are the Galapagos <laughs> and why are they so unique and the, how are they affected? Well, you need a scientist to explain the absolute uniqueness of the islands. I mean, everybody knows that the Galapagos Islands are just a very self, tightly self-contained ecosystem. Uh, and this is why Darwin, you know, developed the origin of the, the uh, origin of the species theory mm -hmm. by studying the, the isolated uh, animals, species of the Galapagos. Uh, it's right on the equator. <coughs> um, it's, a, it's a territory of Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a chain of, I think there's like eight main islands, but there's a many tiny small rocks. And uh, today, you know, there's still, like everywhere, the species are under, um, under tremendous strain. So I use the Galapagos for this story for the mm -hmm. same reason that everybody turns to the Galapagos, because it's unique. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's gone to the Galapagos Islands has to 
become aware very quickly that mm -hmm. things are very different on those islands. You mm -hmm. just don't go around. They don't have restrooms on the islands. Mm -hmm. You're on a boat. You're on a cruise, a very small cruise mm -hmm. boat. And it is. It's a self-contained ecological entity mm -hmm. that has been, been reserved for um, eons, perhaps. I'm not too sure. Well, no. Quite a while, really, anyway. Not for, really. What, for once, several hundred once years. Once humans got there. Yeah, we started um, changing yeah, it. And then, yeah. You know, first it was humans, then it was the pigs. And, <laughs> you know, that... Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's not pristine, but it's still unique. Uh, exactly. What, uh, what is going to be, or how do you bring in some of the islands of the Pacific? Do you talk about the Marshall Islands? We hear about no, the Marshall no, Islands. Not so much. Or um, Fiji yeah, the only experience. Yeah, uh, there's, a lot, there's, there's always this sort of thing. So what I tried to do is to look at some of the stories that people wouldn't automatically think of. You know, so mm -hmm. to say, for instance, oh, you're writing about <coughs> climate change, but well, what about the Amazon? The Amazon's mm -hmm. not in here. Um, the uh, scientist who runs the, the center on the Galapagos is a native of Fiji. And Fiji is described as one of the extinct countries that you know, is lost to climate change. Mm -hmm. So, and there's references to these, these sort of countries. Um, some of the island countries and the low-lying countries are either gone or essentially gone. And um, there's a, um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a thing, there's a, to me, its significance. It's a, it looks like it, it is a throwaway line, but he makes reference to the fact that um, his country, Fiji, is now represented in the Circle of the Fallen. The Circle of the Fallen is, a, is, a, is at the United Nations headquarters, and it's the flags of the countries that have disappeared to climate change with the flags that kept at permanent half-staff. Which to me, I think, because I, I've spent so many years around the mm -hmm. UN, this, um, this, this, this resonates with me. I'm not sure, I think 99% of the people who read the book will just go through that line. But to me, it's, it's important. And it's a question of knowing that uh, the changes that are likely to happen, we're going to have very immediate mm -hmm. impacts on a lot of people around the world, particularly the people who aren't responsible for this. This is part mm -hmm. of the m enormous injustice that the first victims are the people who didn't, ha didn't cause the problem. Mm -hmm. That's very true, and we see it today. Yeah. The well, economically sure. developing countries are suffering much more mm -hmm. than the developed countries, mm -hmm. and the developed countries are the ones who have really been the, mm -hmm. the engines of producing so much of this global warming that's mm -hmm. taking place. There are 193 countries in the UN General Assembly today how many flags are flying in 2052 in the circle? Oh, I didn't. I didn't count. <laughs> I didn't See, count them. No, all. Uh, because here's the thing. Like, there's uh, there's another place in there talking about Tajikistan, mm -hmm. which you know is a is a, a landlocked country, part of the former Soviet Union. I was doing some journalistic research a couple of years ago um, on uh, water resources in various countries, and I was reading about Tajikistan, mm -hmm. and what I think it was an Oxfam report. It wasn't a UN report that uh, talked about the, um, the, the problems of Tajikistan, that the, the Soviet-era cotton production really mm -hmm. decimated the soil, not only by just taking the nutrients out, but the chemical fertilizer mm -hmm. that were po put in. And then you had the glaciers, which, as you pointed out, are melting. So in the story, um, Tajikistan, so I'm looking at this in reality and saying, Tajikistan is running out of water and soil. You know, so I, I put a little bit in here about Tajikistan basically emptying it out. Mm -hmm. So again, to try <laughs> to put it into a, a UN context, um, the, uh, nobody really wants to talk about um, states that basically don't exist anymore. You talk about decelerating economies or something, but basically what you're talking about is empty countries. They're gonna be countries like Mali, Tajikistan, mm -hmm. that won't be sustainable anymore. So. They'll pr we would, the UN would probably go through the, the, the show of saying that there still is a Tajikistan. They won't be able to say there's still a Benawatu, you know, because mm -hmm. Benawatu is going to be underwater. But um, so how many, by 2052, how many flags are going to be flying is going to be as much a political decision as, um, as political decisions are made now. We'll have to count them. Yeah. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.
globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of media outlet, be it a community access television station or a PBS station, or you're involved with an educational institution that has a intra campus television hookup, or you just have an interest in our programs and would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Go in, download them, and you're welcome to provide them as at no charge. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service to help people better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at probably the number one international issue, and that is climate change. Climate change is roaring today. Every time we pick up the newspaper, we see more and more scientific studies and articles about how our climate is changing quite dramatically. And my guest today, Mr. James Worst, has written a new book dealing with the, really the horrors of climate change. Mr. James Worst is a journalist who specializes in international affairs. And as I mentioned, he is the author of the new novel, Three Degrees. Jim, let's focus on, I think you mentioned there was a, a sort of a normal family in Albuquerque mm -hmm. that had, uh, their whole life, uh, their lives upended because of this climate change in 2022. Well, see, this is the thing that you're, you're not going to wake up one morning and say, oh my God, we hit three degrees. Right. It's gradual. It's going to build up. So it's not that they are realizing what climate change has done. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just they're living with it. Uh, they are, um, the father is a, um, is an agronomist. He's a teacher at, mm -hmm. uh, at the University of New Mexico. And uh, his his focus is to try to uh, find and develop uh, strains of corn that can survive in the climate, changing climate, which is going on now and will go on in different mm -hmm. parts of the world. You know, as, as it becomes more and more impossible to, you know, grow wheat in Oklahoma, you're going to look for d resistant wheat, you're going to look for rice, you're going to look for all of the essential grains. So he happens to be focusing on, uh, on corn. He's also Mexican-American, so he's got the, he's got a, um, a historic connection there and his work is unusual in that rather than try to develop um, a new strain he's trying to deconstruct to come to one of uh, to find an original to find original strains mm -hmm. of um, a species of corn that could survive and so there's a little bit of tension there because most schools are financed by corporations that you know want to develop things they can patent, and he's going to go the other way, so there's some tension there. And his daughter is the assistant to the woman who's running for vice president. So you see some of these storylines mm -hmm. do intersect. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at these problems, and we, uh, you're, you're talking about adaptation, basically in 2052 you're, you're going to adapt, it doesn't happen overnight. Right. These changes come incrementally, and we mm -hmm. see them right now. Sure. Uh, a lot of people use the analogy of boiling the frog. You mm -hmm. just turn the heat up slowly and the mm -hmm. frog is not aware that <laughs> the frog's being boiled. But this is what exactly is happening to our planet. We see mm -hmm. that the growing season in some places is longer. We mm -hmm. see that uh, places are sinking, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. Mm -hmm. Oceans are rising mm -hmm. and that type of thing. But it is happening incrementally and by 2052, it's going to be a, a crisis proportion. What role, uh, the UN has played a critical role as far as bringing the countries of the mm -hmm. world together for these international mm -hmm. conferences, the inter, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a very mm -hmm. eminent group of scientists who mm -hmm. have been talking about this topic since 1988 and produced five studies. What role can the UN play and what role can the rest of us play to try to deal with this problem today so that it doesn't get that today. Do you have any solutions? Today as opposed to in the book. Well, you know, both. Hey, but, well, <laughs> both. In the <laughs> book, since it's already happened, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's, as you say, it's adaptation. You're trying to do, uh, the UN does figure in, the UN actually has space stations in 2052 uh, because they have to. Um, why, why do they have to? Well, they have to because um, one of the things, see, I, 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 this may be a bit of a diversion, but I'll, I'll, I'll loop back. Um, I'm not a science writer. Uh, most of my writing has been on uh, security issues, peacekeeping, weapons, mm -hmm. uh, international law. Um, so I started looking at peace, uh, sort of looking at climate change as a security issue, not as a scientific or a medical or an agricultural issue. That um, that look at it as how the loss of water, the loss mm -hmm. of arable mm -hmm. land, 
the refugee flow that would come from, um, from climate change would lead to political disruptions. And it's already happened. I mean, it's happening in Sudan, it's happened in, um, you know, there's, Syria. there's Syria, there's taken, uh, the, there's a very good argument that, you know, the, 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 uh, the trigger for the Arab Spring, the protests in Tunisia, was caused by climate change, by a shortage of, uh, of, shortage of grain. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as a security issue, and so that's why I, um, why you know, why there's a scientist in there. But how you look at these things now and then, uh, then meaning tomorrow, uh, not then, exactly right. um, as a, as a, as an all-encompassing problem. It's not just a matter of oh, the poor polar bear. You know, it's 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 far more than that. I mean, when you've got a case where uh, you lo start losing the polar, the North Pole, the polar mm -hmm. ice cap, and the first reaction is some people are going, oh good, it's going to make it easy to drill for oil. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, the wrong this approach. Is a, this is not, <laughs> wrong this approach. is not the people should be running things. <laughs> um, so bringing it back to the UN in 2052, yeah. um, you've got the, the UN as, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the space station, that's, that's mm -hmm. I, I promised to loop back to that. Um, so w what happens, in the story is that you know it does lead to some tremendous political and cultural and social disruptions. And one thing that happens, uh, and why it happens, you'll have to read. I'm not going to tell you, uh, is that there's a satellite war. Uh, two satellites, one, sat one satellite of one country attacks a satellite of another country. The debris, and then it starts a war. But the debris then starts destroying even more satellites. So you got this exponential effect mm -hmm. of of increasing amount of debris, and we basically blind ourselves. There's satellites, and this is true, I mean, they exist now, about 23,000 23, miles above. So they aren't affected, but everything in low Earth orbit, which is basically almost everything, including you know, the, the, uh, the satellite that helps your cell phone work, uh, are gonna, like people see this show, are gonna be destroyed. So there's a crash program to develop um, space stations that can uh, function as satellites, but are uh, impervious, well, are resistant to all of the debris. So that's why the UN has satellites, uh, because everybody's got satellites. Uh, they need it. And um, the, on the Earth, the UN role is pretty much what you've got now. Um, the World Health Organization, uh, uh, international migration, uh, um, uh, uh, food and agriculture organization trying to cope with what exists. Mm -hmm. So that's the future. Today, what you're doing, um, what the UN is doing, and just have to do more of it faster, um, and just to keep encouraging the countries. You know, right now, you, know, you said the Paris Climate Agreement, Syria signed it recently. That means there's only one country outside. Um, so the uh, so everybody has to continue working, and you know, the the Secretary General, <coughs> this one and the previous one, using the bully pulpit mm -hmm. of his job to um, to to um, uh, keep it as a priority issue in the world. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and as, we, well, as you mentioned, the U.S. is the only country not in the Paris Climate mm -hmm. Change Agreement right now that may change, but uh, this is an issue that we need to move on very quickly. It may, we're, we're too late in some respects, but we need to move very quickly. And every day we're reading more and more, you're talking about water a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Water is a major problem. People are fighting you know, over water right yeah. now in uh, villages in worse. Nigeria yeah. Yeah, or Kenya. You've got Lake Chad that used to be as big as a football field, now it's as big as a football. It's mm -hmm. shrunk that much. We see that the polar bears are actually starving, mm -hmm. the ice is melting from under them. Jordan is a country that is on the verge, apparently, as the scientists have reported, of running out of water very quickly. So we need to move on this, and of course, our viewers can get your book, Three Degrees. They can go to Amazon.com, right. and they can watch our program and learn much more about this topic, mm -hmm. a very fascinating topic, and it affects all of us. It sure. is, uh, in many scientists' opinions, the number one problem in the world. Mm -hmm. We were going to talk about your other book, Jim, UN Association of the USA, A Little Known History and Advocacy and action, but mm -hmm. we talked about that in our last That's interview. Right. So if our viewers would like to watch that one, they can go back about, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I guess about a year or so, something mm -hmm. like that. A little less, but yeah. A little yeah, less, yeah. all right, nine months, and go to the website, globalconnectionstelevision.com, mm -hmm. and see it. But again, this topic is so important, and it's one that we can't escape. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we can avoid, mm -hmm. we can overlook, we can say, well, they'll get better tomorrow, or let somebody else deal with it. But this is a problem that everybody 
is going to suffer mm -hmm. from, and everybody has to participate mm -hmm. in doing it. And of course, the UN has been a key coordinator in bringing the countries of the world together yeah. through these international conferences and agreements to help us focus on it. But Jim Worst, I want to thank you so much. And very I want to say one more thing. Five because seconds. We're five seconds. <laughs> it's really about the people. We were talking mostly about science uh -huh. and politics in this, but you know, it is, a, it is a story about people. And there's some, I, personally, I think there's some really interesting people in here. So it sounds like. That's, I want to be sure that that comes across, that thank it's you. just not a, a list of of problems. That's right, no problem. Jim okay. Morris, thank I'm you so very much thank you. for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thanks nice for being here. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.